This is the White Coat Investor Podcast, where we help those who wear the white coat get a fair shake on Wall Street. We've been helping doctors and other high-income professionals stop doing dumb things with their money since 2011. This is White Coat Investor Podcast number 355. Today's episode is brought to us by SoFi, the folks who help you get your money right. They've got exclusive rates and offers to help medical professionals like you when it comes to refinancing your student loans. That could end up saving you thousands of dollars. Still in residency, SoFi offers competitive rates and the ability to whittle down your payments to just $100 a month while you're still in residency. Already out of residency, SoFi's got you covered there too with great rates that can help you save money and get on the road to financial freedom. Check out their payment plans and interest rates at SoFi.com slash white coat investor. SoFi student loans are originated by SoFi Bank NA, member FDIC. Additional terms and conditions may apply. NMLS 696-891. Our quote of the day today comes from Robert G. Allen, who says, how many millionaires do you know who have become wealthy by investing in savings accounts? I rest my case. It's true. You got to put some money at risk, right? You can't just put it all into CDs and savings accounts and money market funds. You got to put some money into stocks and real estate and let your money do some of the heavy lifting for you. Thanks so much for those of you out there who are practicing medicine, doing dentistry, law, all these high-income professions. They're not easy. And uh, if you're listening to this on, you know, while you're working out or walking the dog or on your way to work or coming home after a bad day, just know that we appreciate what you're doing. You know, Katie and I both had, um, you know, colonoscopies reason- recently, and uh, it's interesting to interact with the system as a patient you know, and to get that view from the patient's side. And, and I just become so much more grateful for what everybody's doing out there. Every time I or one of my family members has an interaction with, you know, the healthcare system in particular, but uh, just about any high-income profession. All right. For those of you who aren't aware, we have a free 12-week email course called Financial Boot Camp. And if you're like most doctors, nobody taught you anything about managing money or investing. Financial Boot Camp is the financial education you need to convert your high income to wealth. It's only 12 emails, one a week for 12 weeks, but could be worth millions of dollars over your lifetime. Sign up for that at whitecoatinvestor.com slash financial boot camp. All right, we've got a great guest today I learned about not that long ago who uh, is actually, you know, shares a specialty with me, but uh, also shares, you know, a love of working part-time in that specialty and doing some other cool stuff with their life. A lot of which has an impact, not only on your patients, but also on your own burnout. So let's get Dr. Daria Long on the line. And we're going to talk about burnout as well as a whole bunch of other interesting topics and what she's doing with her life right now. Our guest today on the White Coat Investor Podcast is Dr. Daria Long. She's an emergency physician who's been dabbling in a lot of other things in her life. She actually has had a really fascinating career, but I'll bet there's a fair number of our listeners that don't know you and would like to know you a little bit better. So why don't we start, uh, Daria, with you telling us about your upbringing and education. All right. Uh, so we're going back, like we're, we're rewinding a, a lot there, right, Jim? Um, uh-huh. It's such a pleasure to be here. So thank you. And hello to uh, all of your listeners. So I uh, grew up in Tennessee and I live in Atlanta. I am a girl from the South, but I uh, ended up going up North for college. It was kind of interesting since we're talking about career paths. I was accepted to medical school out of high school. It was a, wow. a joint program. And I, um, It was at the University of Rochester. And so essentially you had to graduate. um, You didn't have to take the MCATs. You can major whatever you wanted. You didn't have to do any application, which was wonderful. And so I studied abroad three times and I studied classical piano performance at the Eastman School of Music and did a lot of other things. And um, then went to medical school at the University of Rochester and then got into medical school and was there. And kind of a culture shock, having been a poli-sci major in classical piano performance. And I saw a lot of physicians very frustrated by the changing dynamics of healthcare, by the changing dynamics of how they were practicing and how they were being told to practice. And I didn't know what I specifically wanted to do, but I felt that I wanted to have some role beyond clinical medicine. So I ended up uh, going to Harvard Business School, got my MBA there, and uh, 
planned to come back, planned to come back and do healthcare finance. They do healthcare investing, maybe some private equity kind of helped maybe be involved with some operation stuff was always the plan. And after medical school, I was at Yale for um, emergency medicine residency and was watching TV. And Jim, you probably remember it was the swine flu and the bird flu epidemics. Uh-huh. And you'd watch the local news and they would say, you know, stay tuned for the 10 p.m. for the death <laughs> toll for the swine flu. <laughs> and everybody was terrified. My our Yale ER waiting room length of stay was eight hours to see a doctor. This was before we did like that early triage up front or any of that, but still it was packed. And by the time I saw somebody, it was the typical response was, yes, you, you have this, but you are 32 and you are totally healthy. And I'm <laughs> sorry you were scared and you probably caught it in our waiting room if you didn't already have it. <laughs> and you're fine. You're going to be fine. And that was the first time that I thought how we talk about healthcare in television, how we talk about healthcare in the news to the lay person is broken. So I started outreaching to some local news outlets to and uh, to ASAP, working with ASAP, which is the American College of Emergency Physicians, for any of your um, listeners who aren't familiar with ASAP, and ended up becoming a, um, a spokesperson to that with them and ended up becoming a, a national spokesperson with them as I started doing more and more television. And TV was never my plan. I never <laughs> thought I would build a career doing television. Like that was never, I mean, maybe I was in a couple of plays and musicals and shows, but beyond that, no, I had no preparation for journalism or television. So remember I went back to John MacArthur and I'll stop here and let you kind of go from there. Um, he was one of the deans of Harvard Business School and he became a dear friend and a mentor. Um, and I remember saying, you know, I have these TV shows reach out to me. They want me to do stuff. I was like, I have no TV training. I am not skilled in this. Why would I be able to do it? And he said, Daria, you know, why not you? Why not? And I was like, oh, okay, you're right. And hence started really building my career doing television and really communicating mainly to, to the lay person. Uh, what are uh, one one important things they need to know when it comes to their health? Wow, what an unusual career path! And and lots of emergency positions, uh, other shift based specialties too, anesthesia, et cetera, uh, can can kind of have their career take a, a serious left turn and, and do something <laughs> like this. But it seems pretty common in emergency medicine. Did you feel like your training in emergency medicine really prepared you to to do new things uh, that maybe you didn't have any training in doing? You know, I think that's a great question. I think any specialty you can see in your own specialty opportunities. I think emergency medicine, specifically for television, was very handy. You know, the CNN network, NBC, any any of them knew that they could call me with pretty much anything that was happening. And as an ER doctor, I'm like, yeah, yeah, I can talk about that. I saw that <laughs> last week. Um, that's fine. And so it became very useful as I built my career and doing a lot of that, na- you know, which is really mainly how I built it was doing national news. Uh, so, so yes, ER there, being able to think on your toes, talk to a whole bunch of different people and translate really complex medical things into very understandable and manageable terms is, yeah, I think something that we're taught very and do all the time in ER. Now, now you talk like you're not doing anything clinically anymore, like you're spending all your time on TV, but you're still practicing, aren't you? Yes, I will practice as long as they let me until they pry my stethoscope <laughs> from my cold, dead hands. I love it. I, um, I, you know, yes, I practice far fewer shifts a month. I'm no longer my, you know, we, we got out of residency. What was it? 15 was our full time shift a month. I can't remember. Um, I practice far fewer shifts per month now, but I still do. Um, one is I, I love it. I work at the uh, University of Tennessee, Erlanger. I live in Atlanta, but but commute up. We have a, um, I grew up there. We have a farm up there. And so it's very easy to go up. Um, and uh, we have residents there. So it's really fun. It's a level one trauma and you have residents. So you're constantly teaching. And so I truly enjoy it. And I think I learn a lot from my patients there, which I then end up putting into an Instagram reel or something else because you really are the boots on the ground. Like, oh, this is what people are seeing and talking about. This is where they need to have answers. 
So, I mean, as a business, when I think of people inviting me on television, like you have, you've been on CNN and Fox News and CNBC and, and these sorts of uh, stations. I, I don't think of those as paid opportunities. Is that a business for you or is this kind of a, a passion project and outreach for you? <laughs> That's a great question. And if you are not careful, I talked to a couple of friends of mine who do television Um they television could just become a really expensive hobby for you. So you have to be very deliberate when people say, we want to be a doctor on TV. I have to say, well, why? Let's, let's look at the, what the end goal. So yes, at first when I was doing local television and, you know, some national, you're just trying to get your name out there. Um, once it became more of a medical contributor and in working as that, then that becomes more of a paid role. But also for me, you know, and, and for everybody, kind of depends when somebody says, I want to do television. Like, what is your end goal? For, say, I have a girlfriend who's a plastic surgeon. Her goal is to drive people to come to her business where she does plastic surgery. My goal, on the other hand, is not to drive people to come see me in the emergency department. <laughs> I do not need to stimulate any ER demand. Um, <laughs> but as a result from a kind of a, a business model, for lack of better, if you think of how how I structure it, yes. Sometimes it is being paid by a television show, a TV programming. I'm working on a number of different pilots now um, it, it, on a variety of different TV shows. You get paid for those. But also it is once you build a name and a brand, which comes from doing television, doing it regularly, producers know you can do that. Then, then you figure out, well, who's going to be the person paying you? Is it the consumers? Are you doing courses or things like that? Are you having brands pay you for ads or for what I tend to do in my biggest revenue drivers are a lot of collaborations and spokesperson roles with different brands. So large corporations and hired to speak also by large corporations. So for me, a deal with Mucinex or Bayer or Tylenol McNeil, um, Pfizer, the CDC, all of these are groups that I work with and they hire me to function as a spokesperson. So I'll go do a uh, lot of TV shows, TV appearances and things on their behalf. Oh, very cool. Now this, uh, I've done a lot of things with ASAP. We're actually going to have a big part in the scientific assembly this year. We're doing yeah. a, a day long financial workshop the day before the assembly starts. Amazing. This year. But you're, you're, are you the spokesperson for ASAP? Are you one of multiple spokespersons? How does that work? No, I'm one of many and some really great, brilliant minds. So there's the ASAP Communications Committee, and often and that works on, you know, what are the messages that we're getting out? And then within that, there are people who are kind of become spokespeople for ASAP. Um, and so Mag, you know, to, to help and do that. So but that one, that's not paid. That is just because it's a, an important mission. And I think yeah. it's really important that we tell the story of the emergency physician um, from our perspective and, you know, wear that white hat as emergency physicians and have people see us as that. Yeah. There's certainly a lot of volunteering going on at ASAP, but, uh, <laughs> that happens a lot with ASAP. Yes. So, yes. you know, you, you look yep. at the dues you pay and you're like, surely there must be more money than this. But, uh, <laughs> but, uh, yeah, there's a lot of people who have done a lot for their professional societies, yeah. uh, basically pro bono. All yeah. right. Well, some of the work you've done has been super interesting to me is you participated, not participated, I mean, helped run a burnout study on women, not women doctors, but women. Can we talk yes. about the key findings of that study? Yes, absolutely. That was the burnout study in women. So one of the things I was doing was creating um, creating a platform, which we called truve.com. And the goal is to be, you know, kind of my mission when I speak to, to, to the lay public and to, to general and social media and different things is making it easy to keep for women, to keep themselves and their family safe and prevent accidents, prevent illness, and to know what to do, kind of that first step to do if something does happen and give them peace of mind around all of that. Because especially as women, as moms, you're trying to take care of everybody's health, you're overwhelmed by all the health information you're seeing, you're feeling stressed, you're feeling burnt out. So as a part of that, I had wanted to do an article on burnout for Truv, Um, and was trying to look through the data and really try to cull through things. And I realized that there wasn't a lot of data when it came to all the different hats that we as women wear. And there's a lot of thoughts on here's workplace burnout, which is how the WHO defines burnout. But what about what are all the other stuff we do? And <laughs> why can I take two women who might look 
very similar, but one is losing her mind with stress and one is, okay, what's going on there? So, so I was super cu- um, curious about that. So part of, you know, another part of the, the business model of what I do was the creation of True Lab, which is where we partner with, where we find and match, kind of match make really exceptional researchers with media outlets, with corporate funding to fund all of this. So the Burnout Study of Women was the very first one that we did. I found some brilliant institutional researchers at the University of Tennessee who have done a ton on burnout. So the three of us were co-PIs, brought good housekeeping on board as our media outlet, and they uh, to be featuring us in their big conference and in all their and in magazines and digital and print and number of things for that. And then as a result, was able to bring on a couple of corporations, Cliff Bar, Lunabar, another foundation, were able to come on and they were able to sponsor this research to really create this new thing where we can get research done essentially from ideation to our very first publication was a year. And I was like, you can't do that with the NIH, (laughs) but when you have really great institutions and you can partner with corporate funds and still with them, we had an IRB, we kept Chinese wall. They, you know, Cliff Bar, none of them had no impact on the data. We were very clear for that. Um, You can really get, great things done. So kind of created that model, which wasn't even part of my initial plan, but really was an exciting evolution. So we created the Burnout Study in Women, and it ended up being the largest um, academic uh, full-scale IRB study on burnout post-COVID. Had over uh, over 4,800 women complete a 30 to 45-minute survey uh, and got really fabulous findings from that. we actually are in the process of, we just published, we published our first paper. We have a poster up on it, a conference presentation, and we're in the process. I was just reading our second paper manuscript before this this call. Um, so that's the background of it. You had a specific question, Jim, though. Did you ask me about one of the findings or yeah, did I answer yeah. it? I mean, I mean, it's fascinating to do research, but, you know, I, I, I'm a community emergency physician. Yes. I'm very interested in the bottom line. What do you find when you did this study (laughs) on women? So a lot of different things. And a lot of these things will go for women, for men as well. We had men, we we did not exclude men from the study, Jim. Y'all were allowed. (laughs) We just focused on women. Um, So a couple things, and then I'll go into a couple different frameworks. Because we've also done, ended up, this has created some follow-on research. We've done some qualitative research in executive women as well um, to really find out and, and Done, been speaking with some physicians as well. So when you think about, you know, when we think about burnout and, and what's happening, a couple of the top things that came up, of course, is it is, we found that 87% of people felt that they needed to be able to do everything and do it all. And in terms of like all the expectations that they had for themselves, 87% of them, I feel like I need to be able to quote, unquote, do it all. 7% felt that they actually had the resources to be able to do all of the demands for which they thought they needed to be able to do it. So it's okay with 87% of them think they need it and only seven think they do. So there is this discrepancy. And when you look at models in psychology and burnout, it is a balance between your resources, the, the, or I'm sorry, between your demands, the things you need to do and your resources, which are your abilities to handle all of them. That's the case, whether it's burnout at work or anything else. And so we found that it wasn't, my demands, my resources might differ from another woman's or another man's, but it is that discrepancy between your demands and your resources. That discrepancy is going to directly predict your burnout. Okay. So we call that the do-it-all discrepancy. Now we have this framework that is universal across people. We can say, well, your demands might be different, but we know if we can lower your demands or raise your resources, okay, now we have a way directly to handle burnout. So that was kind of a framework that we created. Another thing was that an inter- a couple of interesting findings. We wanted to say, look at beyond, take this beyond workplace burnout, because that's how, the, again, how the WHO defines it. We said, what about parenting? What about personal life? What about caregiving? Can all of those can all of those contribute to burnout? And we found that yes, in fact, I mean, as we would expect, but uh, to the degree, they are. They all are. Um, they all contribute to burnout. They all kind of have their individual slices, of places of burnout, and their spillover. So the more per, uh, employee-based wor- work burnout you have, the more likely you are to have parental and personal burnout, and vice versa. So there's interroll spillover there. 
So again, now, and these are all kind of background. It's like, okay, now even more reason let's to target these things because yes, as you know, when you're feeling burned out at work, you're going to bring it home. But sometimes you need data to be able to find actionable solutions for it. One other thing for all the working moms who are your listeners, we had a hypothesis that being a working mom would be more burnout, Jim. Would you believe that what we found that working mothers had less parental burnout than non-working mothers? Interesting. Right? So this is going to be a place that we are going to have to dive in more, but the you know, we're, we were just hypothesizing at this point. We were so surprised that the people who had the least burnout were part-time working mothers had the least parental and personal burnout, then full-time working mothers. And then the non-working mothers had the most personal and uh, parental burnout. Wow. That's so, fascinating. Yeah. Isn't that? You know, you know, this framework you use uh, about you know, having resources and increasing resources. Tell us what you mean by resources. I mean, time's a resource, money's a resource. What else are you thinking yes. about when you use that? So uh, there are external and internal resources. We'll just start on, start on, the, you asked about resources. Can I start on the demands? If that's okay. I'm, I'm going to, uh, but your demands. <laughs> <laughs> so you have your internal or external demands, your external demands, you know, having to go to work, Maybe, uh, you know, that that's obviously a demand. You have children who you have to keep fed and alive that's looked bad <laughs> or frowned upon if you don't do that. You know, you have a roof you have to keep over your head. Those are kind of things that have always been there. But those things have become more complex. And again, if we looked at the burnout study, about 84% of people felt that those demands have become more complex significantly than our parents' generation. You know, work is no longer nine to five. It is 24-7 responding to emails and slacks and all the different things at all times. Um, child care is no longer just keeping them fed and clothed. It is, you know, is your child in a travel soccer team by the time they are three? Have you signed them up for a Mandarin <laughs> by the time they're 18 months? You know, have you, you know, have you, are, am I ready for this Valentine's Day party that I'm chairing at my pre for apparently chairing a Valentine's Day party that I'm chairing for his party next week for my <laughs> first grader? All of the things that have become more complicated in our kind of external demands. And then on top of that are kind of internal demands that we phrase that we kind of put on ourselves. Um, and some of these are idealized that are, uh, you know, do I look as good and does my home look as good as my neighbor does on social media? You know, when I do that Valentine's Day party, am I taking angel food cake that I baked myself using wheat that I threshed in my backyard because it needs to be <laughs> organic and not part of the dirty dozen? And while I'm doing that, does my hair look ombre beautiful like everybody else does on, on reality TV and again on Instagram? So there's all these demands, and, we, uh, and these have just increased in, in caliber and complexity and just sheer volume. And then there's your resources. Your resources, of course, are income. Yes, we know that to a certain extent, having more income is predictive and protective against burnout. Um, having a supportive partner, that's also a resource that is protective against burnout. Incidentally, age, <laughs> the older we get, the less burnout we experience. We can do, we can probably discuss that for a while, um, but it was kind of a negatively protective. Um, so there's those resources. What is your support system? You know, what is your finances? What do you have for that? How, you know, time do you have? What degree of auto autonomy do you have? What degree of flexibility do you have? And then there's some internal resources that, you know, the world can go on around us, but what to you, what do you have that is protective? And one of the things that we found is something called a sense of coherence. And, you know, you've probably, Jim, I'm sure you're aware there, you know, the 2000s people talk about resilience and they talk about grit and these things being so important. Um, they talk about optimism, happiness. We found that actually something, a factor called sense of coherence, which is something that doesn't get talked about that much. It was actually more protective um, than, than a lot of the things than even um, than optimism. And in fact, when we weight, weighted coherence versus optimism, having a strong sense of coherence was more protective about, against burnout than just being optimistic. Um, sense of coherence was something that was kind of coined um, by a, a gentleman, Aaron Antonovsky, in 1979. It's not even new, but he looked at, he was trying to theorize why people become ill under stress and others become and stay healthy. And uh, he found kind of three factors that factor into coherence, a sense of coherence. One is comprehensibility. 
And it, that is the sense that you're able to make of the world around you, the stories you tell of what's happened in your life. Um, number two is manageability or agency, you know, the degree to which you think you can control things. Um, and the third one is meaningfulness, you know, the meaning that you take from it. You know, if anybody has read Victor Frankl's Man's Search for Meaning, they know about this. It, he specifically looked at what what helped, and he was he was a Holocaust survivor. If anyone is unfamiliar at it, and he wanted to look at what enabled some people to survive the Holocaust and these concentration camps when some didn't. And he found very much that it was very similar to this, this sense of coherence. He didn't use that exact word, but this very much along those lines, that sense of meaning that they found in the experience, the ability to make sense of it or make a storyline out of it and find some roles of agency that actually were more predictive than people who were hopeful about being rescued. So that's why I think sense of coherence is something that's really kind of exciting because it is something that we know is directly tied and protective against burnout. And it is also something that, yes, we're all born with an intrinsic sense of coherence, but it is something that we can grow, which is why I like it. Because, okay, now we can get actionable and, you know, help grow that sense of coherence in individuals. Yeah. Now, obviously, this is the White Coat Investor Podcast. We spend lots of time talking about finances. And so I want to take just a minute to explore something you said earlier, that higher income is actually correlated with reduced burnout. Are you telling me that getting a raise will decrease my burnout? <laughs> no. And interestingly, it is more nuanced than that. And a, a paper <laughs> upcoming, I can't tell all the details on. There are um, various factors where it's, um, if you look differently across personal burnout, parental burnout, then workplace burnout, higher income is not universally, actually, the higher income, the better off it is for burnout. So when you look at Maslow's hierarchy of needs, yes, you have to have a certain degree of, of finances to be able to, to feed and meet at least your basic demands. So yes, a certain income is protective up to a certain point. Beyond that, though, however, income can have some various and some variable effects on burnout. Your study didn't look at what that point is, did you? I mean, <laughs> I've looked at uh, happiness studies, income and happiness. You know, it starts yeah. to level off at seventy or a hundred thousand dollars a year, and pretty much doesn't climb after half a million dollars a year. Yes, um, but certainly more income leads to more happiness. I suspect that that's about where you see it plateauing for burnout too. But I don't know that anybody's ever really looked at that. Right. We didn't quantify it by point of dollar, but yes, it gets to like, what at what point are you able to meet those basic demands that you have a shirt on your back, a roof over your head, and you know you're going to be able to feed your family? Um, below that, you have worse burnout concern, lower happiness. But ab above that, yeah, the income um, doesn't. That, as you said, it does not improve your happiness per se. Um, and depending on how you are pursuing it and the workplace environment in which you are pursuing it, that higher income can worsen your burnout too. All right. Uh, you've alluded to, uh, you know, this difficulty with social media, that people look at their Instagram feed. And of course, that's the highlight reel of people's lives. And we, we compare ourselves to that. Can you talk a little bit about why social media is bad for us and, and what we should do about it? Absolutely. And as a mom, I have, a, I have three kids. I, my oldest is a nine-year-old girl. So I think about social media a lot for her life. But this study was actually very eye-opening to see that how much it impacts us as adults as well. So one of the things, we looked at a variety of factors for social media's impact on burnout. And one of the things was we found the number, the, the top two emotions that women feel after being on social media are envy and worry. Um, particularly in terms of, That's yeah, terrible. right. You know, it sounds great. <laughs> uh, and far outpaced any feelings we had of optimism, happiness, or pride. So why, what's going on? Well, one is it's this self comparison. It is me versus this idealized version. We saw in the burnout study, over 64% of women said they compare themselves against a woman who they perceive as doing it all. And they're never enough. They are never going to be. And that is that, and we talked about those demands, that top half, which is this idealized version, because you can always add more demand. The world is happy to take your time, energy, and your focus <laughs> and make you think that you're not doing enough. And so it is that self-comparison 
that was directly tied to burnout that triggered by that envy and worry um, from social media. Yeah, I think this is particularly concerning for younger people. You know, I I remember an experience we had with our oldest daughter, who's now a very well-adjusted young adult um, in uh, in junior high. You know, we it was time for her to have a phone. We had a you know an older iPhone or something that uh, we weren't using. We're like, we'll just give her this instead of a uh, instead of getting you know a new phone. And after a few months, we realized the damage that social media was doing to her. She was realizing every time she was left out of anything, you know, yes. at the school. And and so after a few months, we took the phone away, got her a dumb phone, and uh, you know, she did a little bit of therapy even. Um, yeah. And I realized, wow, this is really dangerous. And uh, I think, you know, here in Utah, our government is actually passing laws against social media use by by minors. And, you know, and some families are actually suing the government because they feel like they're being censored, you know, but I think there's a pretty good consensus that it's, that it's bad for young people, that it's really doing damage. Uh, uh, did you get any sense of that from is, the burnout yes. study? So, so, and I'm on the uh, board of a couple of different organizations regarding social media. One is the Organization for Social Media Safety, and they're specifically putting laws in place to help to uh, protect young people. Uh, I was uh, speaking at a conference um, a while back, and I was talking to one of the original, uh, probably make number five at one of the social media platforms that will go unnamed. And he <laughs> said, I realized what was going on when we had more behavioral scientists working at our app than we had programmers. Wow. I realized where they were going with this very early on before any of the rest of us knew. Um, what we found also is that, you know, it is the mere presence of social media. We found that that those negative so- feelings, that self-comparison was even more important of a factor than time spent. So sometimes people will say, well, you know, your teenagers, let them spend 10 minutes on the phone, five minutes. In fact, if you get on the phone and your first post you see causes you to feel less than, it doesn't matter. The damage is already done. So we we'd never seen that before. It'd be like this is such an important factor. It is more important than the amount of time that you actually spend on it. Um, I created a term, and jokingly called it comparatonitis. Uh, in, in, in part because it's helpful, more helpful to laugh about it because you're on social media and you see your friend and her children look perfect and her house looks perfect and her hair looks perfect and her career looks perfect. And, um, or, and this can happen with men or women. And it can be easier instead of saying, oh, I'm having self-comparison. I'm having envy. This is true. And just say like, you know, I'm having a bout of comparatonitis right now. I'm having a flare. It's kind of like the gout. And I just need to get off. You know, I, you don't need colchicine. You need to get off of social media when you're having compa- a flare of comparatonitis. So, so yes, we know, obviously, social media um, has led to in the most severe things. You know, we, we hear of, of people committing, ch- children, especially teens, committing suicide and, and really drastic, awful outcomes. But on a much greater volume of people is this degree of insecurity, depression, feeling left out, feeling isolation, and that grows um, with social media. And that, I think the biggest conclusion is that it's it's not just children and teens who are susceptible to this, but we as adults very much so as well. Do you think the good can outweigh the bad, or should we all just get off Facebook and Twitter and Instagram? I think about this a lot because for me as a doctor on television, I have a lot of followers on Instagram, and I, I that is part of my work. So I I think about this regularly. Um, I think it can be beneficial. I think there are studies out of, uh, there are studies from some of the happiness researchers at at Harvard looking specifically at what actions on social media can be protective. So we know that protective, you know, just passive consumption of social media, just sitting there doom scrolling, which incidentally is what TikTok is designed to do. It is designed, you finish one video, it just goes to the next, that autoplay feature. Doom scrolling, passive consumption is directly correlated with depression and burnout. On the flip side, actively getting involved, using Instagram or Facebook to find a friend, message them, engage with them, um, be in a friend group on, whether that's on Facebook, those groups and those networks that they have enabled 
if you think about that, like, you know, groups with medical conditions, groups with specific types of children and work careers and the groups that they can have together and create that community on Facebook, there's a value there. So like many things, it is neither, it is not a yes, no question. It is a, we need to be aware of this. Um, like Paracelsus said, the dose makes the poison. We can use this in a way that is good, but we can also too much of it in the wrong way can be very harmful. Good advice. All right. Well, the majority of our audience is doctors and their trainees. And the data these days is showing 50%, even 60% of doctors are burned out. They have at least some symptoms of burnout, you know, depersonalization, cynicism, uh, emotional exhaustion, yeah. et cetera. What advice do you have for doctors in particular about burnout? So I think that's a great question, Jim. And one of the things, one of the reasons I did the burnout study is because I thought, you know, there's more to this than self-care. We don't need a doctor, another doctor appreciation day bringing me pizza. <laughs> that's not going to help my burnout or donuts or anything. What are things that can be done? So I think one of, especially when it comes to physicians, one of the traps that can happen for burnout is to say, well, here's the things that you individually as a physician can do to reduce your burnout, um, your personality and uh, self-care things that you can do. And while that is true, coherence, thing, building things like that, building your network, spending time with your friends and that support network around you and calling them, getting off of social media, eating well, sleeping well, all of those things, yes, can build your resources. Um, and decrease your burnout, decrease that do-it-all discrepancy margin. With physicians especially, we have to look at all the demands that we face. Um, and so specifically from a work standpoint, as we found in our study and other studies have found, you know, flexibility and autonomy are two very important things. And this is especially the case you know, for physicians, for top-level executives. What is the flexibility that you have in your career? Um, what is the autonomy that you have over it? It's, you know, and, and your schedule it makes a huge difference in your ability to um, reduce your burnout. So when you're looking at a new job, you know, what flexibility will you have over, over your schedule and, and choices to be able to make for that? Um, I think another one is uh, one of the things in our, our study of executive women is how much women are more likely. And I think this also falls to doctors as well um, to do the unpaid corporate housework. So women are doing the housework at home and then they come back and they're doing the unpaid corporate housework in the office. So look at that. We, as you mentioned, ASAP, I think ASAP's a great thing to vote. I think ASAP has been a, a wonderful thing for me to be involved in. Um, so not saying ASAP as an example, but look <laughs> at all the volunteer, all the volunteer things or what are, what's your hospital expecting you to do? What is the unpaid stuff? You know, that extends from you know, maybe committees that you're on, mentoring that you're doing. Those things that are are important. So you either have to decide, do I drop these things or do I go back to my administration and say, this needs to be compensated. You need to do one or the other. But don't just keep doing all these unpaid corporate housework that we are very good at as physicians. I remember when I was at Harvard on faculty there, we'd all write these medical chapters and textbooks. We never got paid a dime for that. <laughs> Nobody else in any other industry would ever say, oh, you want me to go write a chapter in a textbook? Sure, let me do that. Take the however many hours it took me to write that chapter and do it totally for free out of the goodness of my heart. No. So be ca very careful with that. Find, go to your administration with the worth of that. That also comes down to also to how you are paid. A lot of doctors, if you're only RVU paid, then you are paid effectively for, for seeing those patients, maybe for charting. What about all the other emails, the other admin, the other leadership things you're expected to do to go to your leadership, you know, to, to make sure that you are either being compensated for those or minimizing the non-paid work you're doing. Um, Another thing that we have seen, now I've talked to, I, since I speak regularly about burnout, end up seeing some different models that, that work in different places where they work better. I think institutions where they do give the physicians more flexibility and autonomy over their schedule, institutions where they kind of help pick up the extra stuff sometimes, you know, some places they provide Bright Horizons childcare. You know, I always joke as a working mom, I'm only one stomach bug away from like <laughs> it all falling apart. So, you know, does your employer provide Bright Horizons child care? You know, another one um, in Texas, they have free DoorDash. You've got to get dinner at home and you're, you're running late. Things like that they can do. And then also really work with your institution if there are a lot of just all the, like, to, to, what things I speak to institutions about is 
how do you take out all the little obstacles and things that don't need to be done from a doctor? Can you take that off of their plate? Whether that is, um, you know, filling out their CME, their ACLS credentialing, having admins help them with prior authorization and uh, treatment denials, things like that. There are things that institutions can do to make their physicians feel more valued, have more time, have more energy um, to really do a better job of taking care of their patients. And when institutions do that, they see that they have better talent retention, they have better physician retention, and it is not cheap for an institution to bring on a new physician. Um, so it is beneficial for the institution as well. So talk, you know, find those things and take that to your institutions as well. Yeah, it's not cheap. That's for sure. I've got a friend no. that's a physician recruiter and yeah. uh, he gets paid 50 grand to bring a doctor yeah. to a hospital. I mean, yes. it's not cheap to turn over for doctors is is a serious expense. Yes. You know, you, you alluded to this earlier that uh, this is particularly bad, I think, for women, because lots of professional women find they've still got the lion's share of duties at home. You know, what advice do you have for them to help them get a better division of labor once they go home from work? No, oh, man, this is a this is a, a good question. Um, yes. For women, it is especially hard. And this is when we have had this the qualitative research. Um, they, they express a couple of fears. One is, especially in medicine, I did medical school, I did residency, I did fellowship, I worked my, you know, what off to get to a point that somebody is respecting me as a physician here, is what, what so many of them say. Um, and then if they have a child, it becomes this issue of either they're afraid that if they do try to cut back, they get put into maybe it's like some mommy track, which they worry they can't recover from. Or they say, and there's nothing formal there, there's no, or there's no way to do so. There's no way to really cut back. It's like either you quit or, or not. There's no, par, no part-time formal track. Or they don't want to show it because they're very afraid that if they say, you know, I'm having a hard time or this is difficult or I have to go for a practice, that they will lose the respect of their colleagues. They will lose promotion abilities, maybe research things. So they kind of fake it. Make it. Everything's great. Nothing's wrong. Of course, I can take on that extra responsibility, that extra leadership role, that extra administrative role, because I'm having no problems managing everything. And then they're secretly and quietly crumbling at home trying to manage all of these things. So one is for institutions and for for managers, and we it's to really create for women formal tracks, you know, to say you have a family or maybe it's not having, maybe, maybe you're caregiving your parent. It is not only for moms, it's, it's for fathers and anybody as well who might have something. Is there a formal track to reduce? A physician is such a valuable resource. If you can keep that physician in the clinical workforce and maybe cut them down to 50%, what are the ways we can do that? We're smart people. We can think creatively about this and get somebody off the 80 hour per week track if they need to be. So that's one of the things. Um, and, and talking openly about that. I think having female physician groups and uh, that you are able to support each other, share best practices and go and mass to leadership to really ask for things is really helpful. Um, another thing is kind of having, you know, we talk about having disconnected time. When you are on vacation or when you go home at the end of the day, are you able to be disconnected and finding that time? It can be difficult because you have to go home and you have to chart, but how can you Find that when you go on vacation, different hospitals sometimes do things like an inbox buddy. I, have, I know a lot of physicians, they do an epic inbox buddy. They're on vacation, so they have another attending checking, checking their epic inbox. So now, at least for that week that they're gone, they're not having to check their epic inbox, and they're actually able to be present with their family. Um, and then I think also when you are home, yes, I did a whole TED Talk on how to delegate and automate and things like that. But I think first is to really, you know, look to what resources you have, whether that is your partner and having a discussion with your partner on how you will share resources, um, whether that is having whatever childcare resources you need to get you the help. Because again, you don't have to do it all. And it is okay to be a physician mom and say, I'm not going to be doing the, the beautiful crafts at my child's school, but I'm going to be present for this, for that, this one event or that event. So again, it comes down to really just being deliberate about your choices and what you're spending time on and, and outsourcing when you can, because as a physician, you probably have a little more income flexibility. So outsource, outsource the things you don't like. Like I remember somebody telling me when I was hiring a nanny, she said, make sure you have the nanny do all the things you don't want to do. So that, <laughs> that minute you get home or you stop doing work, you have, you use that precious time to now be spending time with your children as opposed to, you know, doing laundry or chopping vegetables or something. 
have them do that. There's there's no shame in that. And there's lots of ways to find that without having to hire a governess so you can uh, outsource in a more cost-effective way. You use a phrase frequently that I really like, yeah, being unflappable or unoverwhelmable. Mm-hmm. What lessons about balance and burnout has practicing emergency medicine taught you? Oh, well, um, yes. So to use unflappable, I, I love unflappable. It sounds like you're about 80 years old when you use it, but I think it's perfect <laughs> because it says, how can you go and you have some situation, no matter how stressful? And yes, being in emergency medicine, maybe I self-selected to emergency medicine because I had some of this, but I think being in emergency medicine also helps you. No matter what craziness comes in the door, how do you keep your cool? And that's useful if it's a multi-trauma coming in. It's also useful if it's, you know, your children and they suddenly have 14 different things coming up next week that you need to be able to attend or need to be ready for. So a couple different things. One is what you do in the moment or what you will have done is, you know, we talk about triage. I, we talk about triage in the emergency department. And the reason triage matters, there's research from uh, Robert Sapolsky that shows that it's the ability to isolate and to be able to differentiate what is threat versus non-threat is crucial for our stress levels. So our brains are not intrinsically capable of doing that because you might have 14 different things on your to-do list and then you get another email that comes in and it's uh, about a request to do and they all seem equally noisy. They all seem like urgent and emergent that you have to be able to handle all of them. And now you have 16 things you have to do. But you have to pause and say, okay, what's my most important thing? You know, what's my red in the ER? Who's my level five that I need to go take care of immediately? What's my most important thing now that I need to handle? So when you have 80 different things coming at you, you triage. Whatever, and I do this constantly during my day. Like what even today I had some things come up and it's like, okay, what's my most one most important thing that I have to get done? Because if you've gotten that one or two or three most important things done, then when things get really stressful, you're okay because the important priorities are covered. Um, number two is I talk about like delegate, um, I'm sorry, automating as much as possible. What are all the decisions that you make every single day? Whether that, you know, Steve Jobs wore the same thing every day. You don't have to do that. I think that's a little bit boring, but how can you automate different tasks, things in your schedule, carpool? meals, any number of things, workplace meetings, things. How can you automate as much as possible? And then you also have to delete. So Jim, you're, we in the ER are able to say like, what are the things that we're not going to take care of? What are the things that are not emergent that I'm going to tell you to follow up with your primary care doctor for? And we have to be able to look at our to-do list and, you know, in your, in your life out of the ER, transiting back, say, okay, here's my most important things I'm triaging, but then here's the things I'm going to take off my list. And that comes down to the do it all. We do not have to do it all by whatever definition of do it all um, that we're looking at from some idealized definition. If there are things on your to-do list that you can take off. So you're triaging, you're automating, and you're deleting the things that maybe are there because you felt like, well, every, all the moms do this. This is a good thing. This is what makes a good parent. Take that off. If it's not something that's a high priority for you and it's just taking you away from your most important things, then you delete. So triage, automate, delete. Love it. Great framework to think about that. All right. Our time is now getting short, but I wanted to give you a chance. By the time all is said and done, something like 30,000 people are going to listen to this podcast, mostly high-income professionals. What have we not talked about that you think this audience ought to know? Um. I think, actually, I can I, I give two things. One we, we touched on in the beginning. For me, you know, television, again, was something that I didn't expect and was something off of which I now made a career. I think anybody who's looking at doing television or, or being kind of a thought leader, it's important to always look at what is the yield for it. So if anybody is interested in, in watch, listening to this and watching this, then, you know, again, for me, it was doing national TV, and that is the business model. But for other people, maybe it was growing your practice, in which case you don't need to do national TV. You don't need to be on CNN to grow your local practice if you're an ENT doctor. It's doing local news. It's being involved in the local media circuit and local newspapers and things so people see you as a local thought leader to drive your practice. So I would say use media, not just, hey, I want to get on the Today Show. 
but by figuring out what is your goal, your end goal, and then you can leverage media, um, however, fits that. And it's much easier if it's, you say, I just want to, I need to drive my local practice. Great. Okay. Now you know what you're doing. Um, so I'd say use, just use media strategically because yes, you don't want it to become an expensive hobby. I have seen that happen to people. So (laughs) know where you want to take it. Um, and then I have one more burnout tip that I like to share when I am speaking called batch the small stuff. If I can share that, um, when we talk about the small things, so when I when I talk about triage in, in my talk, I get the reds are your most important things. Your that these are your like your level five patients. The yellows are your, your level three patients. The greens are your level one patients. You still have to get them seen, but how can you get your level one patient seen in a way that doesn't keep you from taking care of the level five septic shock that's in room nine? Similarly, in our lives, we have greens. Greens are things that we have to get done but are really not our mission critical things. Maybe they are, you know, hey, send $8 for Mr. Jones coach's gift or send, make sure you're, you know, you sign up for this Girl Scout cookie link or make sure you sign up to bring in donuts for Janet's retirement party. These little tiny things. And research shows that these little tiny things um, really can be interruptive to your day. And so I think of them, they're kind of like the Compsognathus in Jurassic Park. The little tiny, com- you remember those those little tiny dinosaurs? Uh-huh, like uh-huh. as a single yeah. one, they're like, oh, cute little dinosaur, what's up? Um, as a herd of Compsognathus, they will devour you. And that's what <laughs> these little tiny tasks are like. Just one, sure, I'll send that $8 over. I'll buy that one thing on Amazon. Just one, they seem fine. But constantly throughout the course of your day, constantly interrupting you, trying to do patient care, trying to do the important things, it's distracting you. So I call these, these are your uh, BTSS, batch the small stuff. If it's a more adult audience, I don't always say stuff. I use another word that's S, but doesn't (laughs) matter. You get my drift. Create a folder called BTSS in your inbox. And every time one of these requests comes in, do not stop and do it. Just drag it, drag it to that folder. Um, And then periodically, once a week, uh, once every couple of weeks, or when you are doing something like, you know, carpool, which is, I think, you know, where my soul goes to die is sitting in the (laughs) carpool line, or you're on hold with with a pharmacy or insurance or something, pull out your little, your phone, pull out your BTSS folder and go to town. Get, and you will get 10, 15 tasks done in 40 minutes. You get your green things that you got to get done without taking over your whole day and without derailing the things that are really important and that move the needle. Awesome. Great tip. For those who want to learn more about Dr. Daria, you can actually go to one of her websites. DrDaria.com is one. And then, of course, as she mentioned, uh, this uh, this business, Truva is how you pronounce it? T-R-U-E-V-E? Truve. It's a combination Truve. of com. true, like source of truth, and the French word Truve, which means to find. Ah, very nice. True. Very cool. So you can get more information about her there. Thank you so much for coming on the White Coat Investor Podcast and sharing some of the results from your study, as well as these other helpful tips for burnout. Thank you so much, Jim. And I would also say, if anybody's interested, they're welcome to connect with me on Instagram at Dr. Daria. Um, when I when I'm on Instagram, usually my content is again keeping women making it easy to for women to keep their families healthy and safe and accident free and to know what to do if something does happen with that peace of mind to follow me there. And always love hearing from physicians, hearing stories, if there are stories that people, physicians think that need to be shared with the general public, share them with me and we can help educate the public together. Awesome. Thank you so much for what you're doing. Thanks, Jim. All right. She's got a lot of energy. It's pretty amazing, right? Uh, how much she can accomplish in, uh, you know, in her life and in her career. But you know what? Just like everybody else, we only have 24 hours in a day. You've got to delete out of your life those things that, you know, aren't moving the needle for you. I love her tips about automating, about triaging, and about just deleting stuff out of our lives. I think that is probably the most powerful thing. You know, it's interesting. Uh, Anytime Katie or I try to take something else on in our lives, we got to look at what else we're doing and decide, well, what's coming out? If we really want to do this, what's going to come out of our lives? Are we going to travel less? Are we going to spend less time with our kids? And if not, then it's got to come off of uh, something else, our volunteer work or I paid work or those sorts of things, Um, because it just doesn't make any sense to squeeze out the most important things in order to do more things that aren't necessarily all that important. 
Okay, our sponsor for this episode, as I mentioned at the top of the podcast, is SoFi. They've been a partner with us for a long time, I think since 2013. SoFi could help medical professionals like you save thousands of dollars with exclusive rates and offers for refinancing your student loans. Visit SoFi.com slash white coat investor to see all the promotions and offers they've got waiting for you. One more time, SoFi.com slash white coat investor. SoFi student loans are originated by SoFi Bank and a member FDIC. Additional terms and conditions may apply. NMLS 696891. Don't forget, as I mentioned at the beginning of the hour, uh, Financial Bootcamp. Sign up for that, whitecoatinvestor.com slash financial bootcamp. Free 12-week email course could save you or make you millions of dollars over your lifetime. Become financially educated. Become financially literate. Become financially disciplined. These emails will help. Thanks for those of you who've been telling others about the podcast and giving us five-star reviews. Uh, One just last month came in from Doe123 said, great podcast. WCI should be required reading and listening in medical school and residency. I started listening around 2016. I've listened to every episode since, and I've learned so much. I'm now retired from medicine and still enjoy listening, reading, and learning from both the WCI podcast and blog. Thanks for the great work and helping us docs get our finances on track. Five stars. Thanks so much. Great review. That does help us to spread the word. All right. For the rest of you, we've come to the end of the episode. Keep your head up, shoulders back. You've got this. We're here to help. We'll see you next time on the White Coat Investor Podcast. The hosts of the White Coat Investor are not licensed accountants, attorneys, or financial advisors. This podcast is for your entertainment and information only. It should not be considered professional or personalized financial advice. You should consult the appropriate professional for specific advice relating to your situation. 